Go ahead and go to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14 this morning. On Sunday school for the last several weeks, we've been kind of uh, just doing basically soul winning training, talking about soul winning, uh, just showing different things in the Bible uh, on just how to reach people for Christ and how to see people saved. We don't ever want to forget about that. That, that needs to be our focus. And I want to talk this morning about focusing on souls, focusing on the souls of people. And I've got several scriptures I want to read to you, but look, let's start in Luke chapter 14, verse 12. It says, Then said he unto them that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things, and the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and the lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that thy house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. I want you to notice a couple things in these passages. We see in the, in the first part that we read how, you know, if you're going to make a feast, you know, call in the people who can't pay you back. The people who have nothing to offer you, those are the ones that you ought to be a blessing to. And then we see he gives another parable about the feast and he's, he goes and he has the people they goes out to first and tries to get them to come to this feast, but they've all got excuses. And then he tells them to go to the halt and the maimed and the blind. All these people you know, we would call maybe the down and outers, those who are down on their luck, who maybe don't have a whole lot to offer. He said, you know, go after them. And then after that, he said, you know, there's still room and he said, just go into the highways and hedges, go wherever you can and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. And, you know, as a church, as Christians, our job, one of our main, ultimately our main job is to glorify God. Hey, obviously glorifying God is number one in everything. But when it comes down to what we are physically supposed to be doing as a people, as Christians, as a group, it is to be winning souls. We need to be trying to win souls, not build a social club. Win souls. And for many today, church is a place where people go to make friends and socialize. You know what? There's nothing wrong with that. I hope you all make friends here. I enjoy being around you all. I enjoy being around God's people. There's nothing wrong with socializing, but it's very dangerous when churches get focused on that, when that becomes the focal point. When it's all about their little community life groups and about making connections and building community and they forget that, you know what, our main job is to be winning souls. When our main job is that we're, our main activity as believers is not to be take place inside this building. It's supposed to be taking place outside this building. You know, sending the, you know, getting the gospel to as many people as we can and church becoming a social club, it will always be a hindrance to soul winning for several reasons. And I want to cover these things because what's I do, I like the socializing. I like it. But if that becomes our focus, soul winning will end up being on the back burner. And in fact, soul winning in many of these churches is frowned upon. You'll, and you'll see why as we study the Bible. But those, because here's those who are the most likely to get saved are not usually the ones that we want to socialize with. Look at Luke chapter 4. Look at Luke chapter 4 and verse 14. All right, let's just admit it. Some of us in here, you might, we might be a little snobby sometimes, all right? Have you ever been out in public and, you know, you're, 
you're out eating and you know you have that person that comes walking by with the bad bo and stuff like that and you know it's like you know why are these people you know, got to smell like that. You know, I want to enjoy a nice dinner and I got to, I got to smell these people. You know, you see some of those undesirables that just, you know, and you know, don't go look at all pious. I mean, y'all know what I'm talking about. All right. You know, we, we can get kind of snobby sometimes we, you know, we, we've all been there before, but look what it says in Luke chapter four and verse 14 it says, and Jesus returned in the power of the spirit into Galilee and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. I want you to notice who it was that Jesus came to proclaim liberty to. It was the poor. It was the broken heart. And now why do they have broken hearts? Well, because they've made a mess of their life. They've messed up big time and their hearts are broken because they are suffering because of the sin. Jesus came to get, he came for those people, the poor, the broken hearted, the captives, those who are weak, those who weren't able to conquer, those who couldn't defend themselves, those who were taken captive, the blind people who physically they're not able to do anything. You know, they have to be taken care of. They have to have that help. You know, the bruised, you know, those who've been beaten down, maybe by sin, by the devil. These are the ones that Jesus came to proclaim liberty to. These are the down and outers. These are the ones that are more, most likely to get saved. And look what he says in Luke chapter 19. Turn over to Luke chapter 19. In verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and save that which was lost. That was after the story of Zacchaeus, the man who was a publican. Everybody hated the publicans and they had good reason to. You know, that's like the IRS of those days. We all hate the IRS, amen? All right, that's right. No. We don't hate the people. We hate the organization, right? Uh, we'll try that. But anyway, you know, he, this is a bad guy. And yet Jesus, he goes into this man's house. He eats with this man. That man got saved. And people are all down on Jesus for going and spending time with this publican. And Jesus said... Son of man has come to seek and save that which was lost. Okay? And so if people are lost, they're going to do what lost people do. Ephesians 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past he walked according to the course of the world. Listen, lost people, the, the reason they do the things they do is because they, they're lost. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they're going. They don't know what they're supposed to be doing. You know, and we've all been there before where maybe you've been out on the road somewhere and you got lost and you are, you're doing weird things. You're driving slow. You know, you're just, you're looking around trying to figure out what's going on. You're turning around, you know, and you know, a lot of times you end up doing things illegal because you get desperate. I mean, how many has ever missed their exit on an interstate and it was miles to the next one. And you, you turned around in one of those spots where you're not supposed to turn around. All right. I've, I've done it before. Thankfully, I've never done it when a cop was looking. But uh, I, I've done that. I, I've done that before. We're not supposed to do that. Why did we do it? We got lost, you know, and we uh, we're lost. And when you're when you're lost, you're going to break some laws. You're going to do some things you shouldn't do. And lost people spiritually, they're going to do bad things. They're going to be wrecking their lives. They're going to be being immoral. They're going to be talking nasty. They're going to be dirty. They're going to stink. They're going to, you know, they're going to be all those things that we don't like, that we have a problem with. But you know what? Those are the ones who Jesus came to save. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And when a person gets saved, there is an immediate change spiritually, but not physically. You know, you can go, you can go witness to somebody. You can get somebody saved that's got terrible B.O., and they're still going to have terrible B.O. after they get saved, aren't they? Man, I was at a house yesterday, and let me tell you, it, it stank. 
It didn't stink. It stank. There's a difference, all right? And it, it stank bad. <laughs> and my girls were talking about it when we left there. So what does salvation have to do with your house stinking? You know what? When you're, when you're lost, when you're in sin, you just give up. You give up on life. You, know, you quit caring about things. You, 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 just, you don't care about living a decent life. You don't care about you know, being clean and respectable or any of those. You just don't, you don't care about that stuff. You're lost. That kind of thing is, is going to happen. And you know what? A lot of places and a lot of churches, they don't want to have a whole lot of soul winning going on because you know what? we don't want those people coming to our church, do we? You know, I, you know, who wants to sit in a service next to somebody with horrible B.O.? Huh? I've done it before. I used to know some people, they came to church and... I shouldn't tell this story, but it's too late now. But, you know, it wasn't B.O., but the, the lady, she... she I, I shouldn't be saying that, but she, she let him rip right during, right during church service. I'm not kidding. And they always sat, you know, kind of in the middle, right on the inside edge... And there was like this section in front of him and behind him and next to him. It was like this circle, half circle that was always empty. Nobody ever sat in that circle because everybody knew you don't want to, you don't want to sit there. And so it was bad because there was always that open area there. And so guess where visitors always sat and, you know, and then, you know, visitors would get to listen to that. And I remember hearing for a long time, people are like she, saying she was, I was like, she is not doing that. She does not do that. And one day I was standing, I was talking to her and her husband and we're just standing there talking, and right there in mid sentence, she's letting them rip. And I'm like, did that just happen? You know, most of us when we do that, you know, we get embarrassed, we stop, we make a face, something. She right in mid sentence, she you know she does that, and her husband's standing right there. You know, usually if I do something like that in public, you know, my wife gives me a dirty look or something, and you know, if my wife did that, I would you know I would have a look of shock on my face. But you know, man, it was, it was just totally normal. Nothing and. And you know what? You're going to have people like that, that that come along and make things uncomfortable. You know, they bring in their smells. They bring in their bad habits. You know, they, they've got their issues. But you know what? Their soul is just as valuable as anyone else's soul. They have a soul. If they are a human being, they have a soul. And we are supposed to be winning sinners not the righteous. And we don't want bad people in our church. We want the good people. Let's get the good people in town. Look what it, but look what it says in 1 Timothy verse 1. This is verse 15. Chapter 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on Him to life everlasting. Listen, those are the ones that Jesus came for. Those people that you see out there that you get disgusted with, that you get, you know, that you have that snobby attitude with, Jesus came to save those people. That drunk that you see out walking on the street staggering around at night, Jesus came to save that man. That drug addict, he came to save them. The people in the homeless shelters, Jesus came to save those people. Those are the ones he came for. And you realize those are the ones who are most likely to get saved too. I'll show you that from the scriptures here in a little bit. And their soul is just as valuable as anyone else's soul. There is no soul that's more valuable than another one just because of who they are, because of their rank. It's all about souls. That's what we are about. We are about souls. That's what we need to care about. And how does a person get saved? We need to remind ourselves of this. How does a person get saved? And it's simply by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Timothy 4.9 says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore, we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Those who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. There are no other requirements on there that they have to do this, they have to do that, or they, they you know, we, we do, it's like we, we give up on people way too fast. And we need to understand that, no, these people can be saved. If they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. Not if they will become like us, they will be saved. If they will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will be saved. Listen, I can understand how you could look at somebody and see that drug addict. I mean, you see that meth head with the meth mouth, as they call it, and all that. And you look at that person, and man, they look like they're, you know, they just crawled out of a crypt somewhere. And you can look at that and think, you know what, that person could never be like me. 
And you know what? That might be true, physically speaking, but what do they have to do to be saved? They have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And listen, if that person gets saved, they're going to be just as ugly as they were before they got saved. But you know what? Their soul will go to heaven and that's more valuable than anything in the world. So who cares? You know, we're not going to impress people when they come into this church. If we've got a bunch of meth heads or former meth heads sitting in here, a bunch of people that are still scary looking. If we go win some of these people that have the stretched out ears and all these things that people, crazy things people are doing to themselves these days, that might freak some people out. But you know what? Those people that look like freaks, they have souls and those people could be saved. And we better never forget that. And we shouldn't have a problem with these people if they, if they, if they, come to church and we ought to be willing to deal with some of their issues and deal with some of their bad habits. Sometimes people too, that, you know, they, they do, they, they've got weird things. They make weird noises. They, they do weird things. They say weird things. You, you, you got to put up with some stuff, people. Okay. Let's, this isn't a social club. If we're doing our job, we're going to have some weirdos coming through here occasionally. And we need to be fine with that. We need to try to win these people over because they have a soul. And what is the value of a soul? We all know the verse, Matthew 16, 26, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for a soul? So if we know a soul is more valuable than all the riches of the world and all souls are equal in value, well then, why would we not be the most... I mean, why would we not focus on those who are the easiest to get saved? Why would that not be the focal point? What is it with all these churches, you know, that they're, they're not going to go knocking doors in the slum areas. They're not going to go to the ghettos. You know, they just want to go and they'll leave the door hangers and stuff on the fancy neighborhoods where all the money's at. You know how hard those people are to get saved? I'll show you some verses on that here in just a second. But listen, there's not... One soul is more valuable than another. Colossians 3.10 says, And have put on the new man, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. For ye, And then uh, Galatians 3.26 says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now you all notice in that verse how it's in those passages it's talking about there's no difference between Jew or Greek. And in fact it also says there is no difference between male and female. What's that talking about? Does that mean that, you know, we can go to this gender neutral society? Listen, no, what that's talking about in Christ, there is no difference. Listen, it doesn't matter if, you know, it's like you got a lot of people, it's like a trophy whenever you get a Jew saved. And listen, if you get a Jew saved, great. But you know what? Their soul isn't any more valuable than a Gentile soul. You know, there, there's, no, there's no difference. There's no difference in Christ. And you know what? I, I've been harping on this stupid dispensationalism stuff that's getting shoved down you know, everybody's throats in Baptist churches. That's just a bunch of garbage. But you know, I want to say something about that too, because of the fact, you know, they're, they're always trying to put distinctions between people. They're always trying to divide things up. And they are, and they're taking parts of the Bible and saying, you know, when you study the Bible, you got to figure out who it's written to. Is it written to the Jew, the Gentile, or the church of God? It says in 1 Corinthians 10.32, Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. You see how God divides people up? Listen, that's not God dividing the people up. That's us dividing people up. In Christ, there is no difference. Okay, but with man, there is a difference. For example, the Bible says in Christ, there's neither male nor female. However, is there a difference physically between male and female? Absolutely. That verse there that everybody uses to prove dispensationalism, it shows, you know, it says give none offense. That's what it says. It doesn't say figure out what part of the Bible is written. Everybody says give none offense. Now, are we all offended by the same things? Okay, you know, guys, there can be a group of guys having a conversation and one of the guys can belch and nobody cares. Okay, but if you're, if you're a guy and you're talking to a group of ladies and you belch, Guess what? 
Somebody's going to get offended, aren't they? Why? Different things offend different people. If you're with a Jew, you know, and you offer him a bacon sandwich, he's going to get offended. A Gentile will not get offended by that. Okay, you know, the church of God. If you are, if you're, if you have a group of lost people and they're all sitting around and they're all cussing, nobody's going to care. But if there's a Christian there, they're going to have a problem with that. We are all offended by different things. That's what that passage is talking about. But listen, in Christ, there is no difference between Jew and Greek, male or female. There is not one soul that is more viable than another. And trying to use that to prove this dispensational stuff is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. And I'm telling you, these pastors that keep repeating that as proof are making themselves look like morons. And you know what? They're taking it completely out of context. And we need to understand that when it comes to souls, when it comes to salvation, there is no difference. All right, We're not going to start a ministry trying to reach black America or white America or you know Jews or whatever. You know what? We're going to try to reach souls. That's what we're going to go after. We're going to go after souls. And you know what? Since one soul, or there, there isn't one soul that's more valuable than another, you know, we're going to go after the most souls. I think we need to go after the ones that are the easiest. Here's, is, is it hard to get saved? Well, actually, it depends. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew 19, verse 23, Then said Jesus unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you, that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. You know what? It's hard for a rich man to get saved. But you know what? Poor people don't seem to struggle with it. Now listen, a a rich man gets saved the same way as a poor man gets saved. But rich people struggle with faith way more than poor people do. So you know what? If you want to go out and try to win rich people to the Lord, great. Nothing wrong with that. But you know what? I'm going for souls. So I, I would rather go to the poor. I would rather focus on the poor areas. I would rather focus on those who are more receptive. But you know what? In most churches today, they want to go after the rich. Can anybody think of why they would be more interested in going after the rich? The money. The money. Boy, you know, if we get these rich people, you know, we could, uh, they can start giving their money and we can start doing some of these projects they're wanting to do. You know, we could have a nicer building. We could have nicer things. We, you know, we could get central air put in here. You know, we could, we could do this if we go and get the money. And you know what? Those rich people, they don't usually stink. You know, those rich people, you know, they, you know, they are, they got, they got the nice stuff. They smell good. They have everything going for them. But you know what? Why would I waste, I mean, just hours and hours and all my time going into these nice neighborhoods, just getting rejection after rejection when I can go into a poorer neighborhood and have people that will listen to me and get saved. But you know, those poor people, they're not going to help our church out financially. They're not going to, they're not going to bring a lot of money our way. But what are we going for, people? Are we going for money? Are we building an organization here? Are we a church? Are we about winning souls? It's hard for a rich man, the Bible says. But you know what? It's much. It's, it's easier for the poor. Revelation 18 and verse 15. This is talking about the judgment of Babylon. And I'm believing more and more that Babylon, I believe, I believe is America. And it says in Romans 8, uh, Revelation 18, 15, the merchants of these things that were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught and every shipmaster and all the company and ships and sailors and as many as trade by sea stood afar off and cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like into this great city? Now listen, I, I can't think of any place in the world that's richer than America. I can't think of any place in the world that other countries benefit from more than our country. And let me tell you something. Our country, I don't care what the news media tells you, I don't care what the politicians tell you, our country is filthy rich. And you know what? You all are filthy rich. He's like, no, I'm not. No, I'm, I'm not filthy rich. 
Well, yeah, you're not filthy rich compared to the Donald Trumps and all these, you know, ultra wealthy rich. But, but you realize there was a time if you were overweight, it usually meant you were rich. You know what that meant? If you had more than enough to eat, that meant you were rich. Well, you can be poor and have that today. You know, if you had air conditioning, you were considered rich. If you had, you know, indoor plumbing, you were considered rich. And just because everybody has these things, it hasn't changed the fact that that's still rich. You know, if you, I mean, the multiple outfits that we have, it used to be only rich people had that. The reason we don't think we're rich today is because we have just changed the definition of rich. But let me tell you something. In most of the world, we are all filthy rich. And in most of history, all of us would be considered filthy rich. We have warm places in the wintertime. We have cool places in the summertime. We have cars, multiple cars. We can get from one place to another with very little effort. I mean, running water, all these things that at one time only the rich had them. And we are so stinking and spoiled in this country. We think that just because everybody has these things that we're not rich. No, folks, we are filthy rich. And you know what? That's one of the reasons it's so hard to get people saved in this country. Because they're rich. They're rich at the things of this world. You know, they are increased with goods. They have need of nothing, they say. But the Bible says, they're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You know what? They're still lost. They haven't been saved yet. And listen, we are going to focus on America. When it comes to our soul, we're going to be focused on America. Why? Because, well, that's what most of us can do. We can't get into other countries. We're going to mostly focus on our area. But you know what? I'm 100% for these missionaries that are going to some of these poor countries and that are winning way more than we are in America. And it is. It's always the poor countries that are the most successful. Why? Right? Poor people are more likely to get saved. The Bible proves that. And you know what? I, I think we ought to be behind these people. We ought to support these people that are going into places in Africa and in the Philippines and places where they don't have a lot and they are, they are seeing people saved by the hundreds and thousands. Why would we not want to get behind that? Why would we not want to play a part in that? Those people are getting souls saved. And you know what? That is of eternal value that we cannot even imagine. And we ought to be focused on those things. But you know what? So it, it is. It's hard for rich people, but it's easy for the poor. But most churches today, they're focusing on the rich. And they're neglecting the poor. Because they don't want to deal with the baggage that comes with the poor people. The poor people have nothing that they can offer them. But God said, you know what? When you make a feast, you don't call your friends that can recompense you. You call the poor. And that's who we need to be going after. You say, well, how, we've, we've got to pay our bills. We've got to pay our bills. You know what? Let's let God pay our bills. He'll take care of that stuff. If we're doing the job... He will take care of those things. All right, let's well, stop chasing after the money. If we start chasing after the money, you know what's going to happen? If we, if we do, if we go and we get Mr. Moneybags in here and he starts giving all his, his money and now I'm able to go full time, you know what's going to happen? I'm going to, I'm going to be scared of offending that guy because if I do, if I offend him, I might have to go back to Walmart and I don't want to go back to Walmart. And you know what's going to happen? I'm going to end up trimming the message. I'm going to end up having to water things down. And you know what? That's not what we need. We've got plenty, plenty of watered down churches in America. Plenty. There is no shortage of watered down, liberal compromising churches in America. Why in the world would I want to waste my one life I had to live producing one more of these churches? I'm not interested in that. Forget that. If Listen, if you, if you all want a liberal watered down church, you can find them so easy. All right. If you don't know how, let me help you. All right. It's just called open up the phone book and just point and you, you got it. But you know what? People are looking for churches like this and they need churches like this. And we're going to be that church. And that's probably going to mean we're not going to be the millionaire church. We're not going to have the biggest, fanciest, nicest building, but I promise you, we will be getting more people saved in this church than any other one. And that, and somebody has got to do that. And I volunteer our church for that. And so we're not, we're not going to get caught up in those things. Listen, if Mr. Moneybags comes along and starts giving his money, you know, great. I'm not going to run him off. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time going after those people. It is, it's, it's too hard. And so it's, hard, it's also hard for those who are wise in their own eyes. 
But the Bible says it's easy for children. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 1. And at the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Y'all understand? There's, there's multiple references too where it talks about you know coming as a child. Why does it say that? Because children are the most likely to have faith. Children don't struggle with faith like many adults do. And especially like the smart people, the wise people, the educated people. Children are the easiest to get saved. So why wouldn't we focus on them? Why wouldn't we try to get them while they're young? Why would we not focus our attention on them when they're the most likely to get saved? Some of these old timers, these, you know, thank God for those who get saved late in life. Thank God for those who are here that got saved later in life. But you know how hard that is? And what's the, we're going to go for those people. If they're on, if they're, while they're on their deathbed, we will try to win those people because they can get saved in the 12th hour. They can get saved on their deathbed. But let me tell you something. I would rather get them while they're young. It's a lot easier. It's more likely to happen. You know, it's rare later. The deathbed ones are, are rare. But, you know, getting saved as a child, it's the easiest then. It's the most common. And that soul is just as valuable as the soul of a hundred-year-old you get saved. And so we're going to focus on those things. The Bible teaches, you know, if, those, if people are going to, they have to, if they're going to get saved, they have to humble themselves and become as a child. You know, Mr. Brainiac, he's going to have to, he's going to have to humble himself and say, you know, I've always, you know, I've always been the intellectual type. I've always been the type, you know, I got to understand everything. But you know what? I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to have faith. I'm willing to put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Even though I don't have all the answers for everything, I'm going to believe His Word. Listen, that's rare that that happens. It can happen, but you know what? Why don't we focus on where it's most likely to happen? Go after the children. We see also in the Bible that it's hard for religious people to get saved, but it's easy for the heathens. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 8. Turn over to Matthew chapter 8. Religious people are the hardest ones. I mean, we, we prove that every week when we go out knocking doors and you get these people from all these different religions and you can't... The, you ask these people, how do you know for sure? Or do you know you're going on your way to heaven? No, I don't know. What do you think you have to do to go to heaven? And they give you all the wrong answers. I mean, it's clear these people are lost. It's clear they have no idea what saves a person. It's clear they have never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ but they're still religious and you can't convince them that they need to get saved. And it's, it's a crazy, they will say they don't know that they're on their way to heaven. You can show them where the Bible says you can know that you have eternal life. You can show them exactly what the Bible says. And yet they are not willing to do that. They would rather keep trusting in a system that for 50, 60 years has left them not knowing if they're going to heaven. They would rather keep trusting in that. I've been trying it this way for 50, 60 years. I don't know if it's worked, but I'm going to keep on trying. Because you know what? They're not willing to humble themselves and just trust the Word of God. I mean, I've been doing all this work for 50, 60 years for nothing. Yeah. You're going to have to admit that. You're going to have to realize that. You're going to have to call on the Lord for salvation. But look what it says in Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, uh, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. This is a centurion. This is not a Jew here. This is not a religious man. This is a heathen. And here he is. He cares about a servant and he comes to Jesus Lord, I want you to heal him. Jesus said, okay, I'll come, I'll come heal him. And he, man, he's like, I'm not worthy that you should even come under my roof. You know, the Jews never treated him that way. The Jews never had that attitude with Jesus. No, we're not worthy to be in your presence. They didn't do that at all. But this guy did. The heathen got it. The heathen understood that he was a sinner. And he said, uh, you know, just speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Listen, the, the religious crowd, they were always questioning everything Jesus did. When he would do things they couldn't explain, they would just try to say, he's got a devil. 
You know, it's not legit what he's doing. This guy's like, you know, Jesus, you're so powerful. You don't even need to come to my house. You just need to speak the word. I mean, wow, that's a lot of faith right there. The heathen are more likely to have faith than the religious crowd many times. And then he says, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go and he goeth and to another come and he cometh. And to my servant, do this and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Jesus couldn't find somebody with that kind of faith anywhere in Israel. But he did with this centurion. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And the servant was healed in the selfsame hour. You know what Jesus was saying there? He said they're going to come from the east and the west. He's saying the people from the other nations, the heathen, they're going to come. They will sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom. Those who are of faith in the Old Testament, they will go to heaven. They will be a part of the kingdom of God. But the children of the kingdom, those who descended from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob physically, they're going to be thrust out. Why? Because those people had no faith. They were trusting in their religion. They were trusting in their works. And Jesus said, those people aren't going into the kingdom, but that people like the centurion, these heathen, they will. You know why? Because Jesus knew they would have faith. And we see that that's exactly what happened. You know, there were many Jews that got saved. There were many religious that got saved, but the vast majority didn't. And we see in the Bible that after they got persecuted by the Jews, it caused the Christians to spread out all over the world. And then there were, I mean, major revivals in these heathen nations amongst the heathen, unlike they ever saw amongst the religious people. And you know, one of the problems that we have in this area, we've got way too many churches and way too many religions. They're not doing anybody any good. These people all think they're going to heaven because of their works, because they go to church. And now, because they go to places that call themselves church, that use words like Christians, that talk about the name of Jesus, these people, I mean, we can't convince them they're not saved now. But you go to some of these countries where they don't have any of this stuff, where they're not doing anything, where they're living like animals, these people, many times they have no problem accepting the gift of salvation. They get it before the religious crowd. But once again, when you do, when you go get that heathen, a lot of times they got a lot of baggage, don't they? That religious person, you know, but boy, you know, man, some of them Lutherans, man, they give a lot of money. You know, that, those Lutheran churches, they, they have a lot of money. I've seen some of the financial statements in those churches. I'm like, good night. I should have went Lutheran. You know, I mean, they got money in those churches. You know, we, we should get these people. You know, they're not usually trouble. They're good people, respectable people in the community. They give a lot of money. But you know what? I've knocked on these people's doors and I've tried giving them the gospel and man, are they hostile to it. I mean, good night. The other day, a few weeks ago, we got like three of them and they were mean because we're trying to give the gospel. You know, why would that bother us? It bothered them. It, it did. And I'm telling you, we need to understand. But the thing is, boy, if, if we got these people, we wouldn't need to change their personality to make them acceptable socially. You know, and we start getting their money instead of them getting, you know, other churches getting the money. You know, it'd be so nice. But you know what? People, they are, they're so focused on getting them and they're almost impossible. You know what? Let's just go to the poor. Let's just go to, let's go to the heathen. I'd rather go to those who don't, aren't affiliated with any religion at all. You know, and if, if, if we believe that all souls are of equal value, and if we believe that salvation is not of works, why aren't churches focusing their attention on those who are most likely to get saved? Why aren't those the first people we go after? You know, why, why aren't we going to the down and outers? Why aren't we going, you know, uh, doing more to get the gospel to children? You know, why aren't we more willing to take the gospel to the parts of the world that are much poorer 
than we are. You know, why, but they're, they're so much more receptive. Why aren't we focusing on the poor in our own area? You know, why aren't we doing more to take the gospel to the ghettos? You know, why don't we take more, you know, why aren't more churches taking trips out into Chicago, into those rough areas? Okay, listen, most of the shooting that goes on, it's at night. If you go in the daytime, you'll be fine. You know, just if you're real nervous about it, we'll go out, you know, between like 10 and noon. Okay, they don't start getting up until about noon in the ghettos. I, listen, that is not a lie. All right, that is not a lie. I, I've worked in those areas before. And about noon is when everybody starts getting up and coming out, you know, and, you know, and they are and they're pretty, they're pretty tame in the morning. And things are pretty calm. And I'm telling you, but they're receptive in those places. And you'll see people get saved. And uh, what if they come to our church and they're wearing baggy pants or, you know, toting a firearm or something? You know? We'll teach them they need to pull their pants up and, you know, teach them that don't shoot anybody unless they got it coming. You know, get, you know, do it, you know go get a conceal and carry permit. Do it legally, you know I mean? You know, we're, we're all for gun rights here, you know, as long as, you know, just as long as you do it right and don't shoot anybody here. You know, if we would teach these gangsters how to hit what they're aiming at, maybe these kids would stop getting shot all the time. That's their problem. You know, they don't even know how to hold a gun and they're, you know, it's, it, it's set. You know, if these people would get saved, it would solve a lot of those problems. They're, they're not going to go around shooting each other. And, you know, and so, but we are, we're just forgetting about them. Why? Because they've got nothing to offer us, but we've got something to offer them. So let's do something about it. But you know, the, the real reason people aren't going to these places is because you can't build a church with these groups. And what I mean by that, I'm using the term church loosely. I mean, you can't build a social club that's going to be desirable to the community. And that's what church is all about today. It's all about, you know, building a large, you know, getting a large number of people, getting a certain quality, a certain type of people, a social club. And then you know what ends up happening in these churches? You know why most pastors are losing their hair today and why most pastors are stressed out of their minds today? It's because they spend 90% of their time trying to keep everybody entertained in the church, breaking up petty squabbles in the church. Oh, this person's fighting with this person. We got this drama here and that drama there. They're fighting all these things because they got to keep their little babies taken care of. They got to go around blowing people's noses, kissing people's boo-boos so they can keep them happy because we can't lose these people because if we do, then the offerings are going to dry up. And then how are we going to pay the bills? You know, because we're in such deep debt because we built these mega palaces and things so we can impress everybody. And so we can show off to all our preacher friends, look at this magnificent place we have. And so now you are, you're dependent on these people and you do it. And they are, they're spending all their time breaking up fights, kissing people's owies because we, they're so scared of losing their money. And in the meantime, they're doing nothing to win souls. Well, we, you know, we've got to have stuff for people to do. And so they do. They got to you know, bring in these young guys that can come in and entertain the kids and the teenagers. And they can do all these fun stuff so that people have something to do because families don't know how to do fun stuff together anymore. Families don't know how to enjoy each other. And I just got to have some place I can send my kids and get them out of my hair for a while so they can have something to do. And it is. It's just nothing but a stinking social club. And you know what? If we're going to have a social, if we're going to turn this into a social club, then why can't we do what all the other social clubs do? If you're going to enjoy one of these, uh, join one of these country clubs, you got to pay a certain amount of money, don't you? You know, if that's what you want, if you want this church to be a social club, first thing you need to do is vote me out because I'm not going to have any part of it. But then the second thing you need to do after you vote me out, you need to put a financial requirement to be a part of this church. You've got to give this. I was told this. I, I'm not going to say the church because I don't know for sure it's true, but I was told that one of the churches in town, you are required to donate at least $3,000 a year if you're going to be a member of that church. Now, let me tell you about that church. It is a social club. It is a country club. So you know what? If, all, if the other country clubs are doing it, I don't see why they can't do it. I just wish they quit calling themselves a church. But you know what? If that's what we want, then that's what we should do. But you know what? I'm not going to have any part of that. That's not what we're about. We are not a social club. I don't want to spend all my time kissing people's boo-boos and breaking up fights. Okay? Y'all are adults. You know, you ought to be able to get along. 
You ought to be able to, you know, enjoy your life without people holding your hand. And you know, and but pastor, they're trying to build a following of people that they can be proud of, ones that look a certain way. You know, you know, by in, in Galatians it talks about uh, verse thirteen says, "For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised." that they may glory in your flesh. Why did they want them doing that? They wanted to be able to say, hey, these people, look, look at what these people did to be like us. And we do. We want to make people like us. Look at how everybody in my church dresses. Nobody in my church you know, does this. You know, everybody at all, you know, and they do, they put crazy requirements. I know, I've known of some churches, they make all the ladies wear hats. If you're going to be a member and you're a lady, you have to wear a hat. That's stupid. All right, you know, and, you know, why, why would you do that? Why would you enforce that? First of all, it's not in the Bible, but you know, um, I guess in some groups, circles, it's impressive if ladies are wearing hats in church. I, I think it's kind of weird personally. You know, all our guys, you know, none of our guys have facial hair. We don't allow facial hair in the church. You know, clean shaven. We got a clean cut. Looking gr- gr- That's stupid. How do you do that when Jesus had a beard? All right. You know, how, how, do you, how do you do that? Some places are like that. I know preachers, you know, preaching against, you know, they preach against colored shirts, supposed to be white shirts, always white shirts. These guys, with their facial hair and, you know, colored shirts. Get back to the old paths. You serious? You're, you're going to waste a bunch of time on that. But you know, it's because there's some snobby preacher out there who's looked at as royalty that he has. He has these high standards in his church and everybody in his church does it. Everybody in his church does whatever he says. And look at those people. They're just magnificent looking. Look, they're all, you know, they're all beautiful. They're all clean cut. They're all in shape. They all look like they got money. They all drive fancy cars. And everybody, man, you know, they, they see that and they do. They try to mimic that and copy that. And let me tell you, me wearing a white shirt isn't going to help more people get saved. You know, these things do not matter. But yet, people are getting caught up in these things because it is. It's a social club. It kind of makes it look like a cult sometimes. And when we were at Pilots Convention with the kids, all the girls there, all of them, were wearing these scarves. There's nothing wrong with the scarf, but everyone there was wearing them. And I noticed it, and I'm like, Everybody's wearing... and I looked at my wife, and she was wearing one. And I looked at my daughter, and she was wearing one. And I looked at Sarah, and I said, are we in a cult? Is this... I mean, I guess it's just a style thing and everybody copies off each other. But for some reason, everybody there was wearing scarves. There was no rule anywhere saying the women had to wear those scarves. And there's nothing wrong with those scarves. But it kind of freaked me out, to tell you the truth. Uh, I was like, I ain't joining any cults. You know, if they start putting these kind of requirements on me, I'm out. You know, forget about that. But it was, it was the craziest thing. I think it was just one of those new fashion trends that everybody was into. No, you know, nothing wrong with it, but it, it freaked me out a little bit. But you know what? We're, we're not going to do that. We're not going to get caught up in those things. And there's, there's a lot more scriptures I want to cover. We don't have time for it. But you know what? Don't be ashamed of what we do and what we preach. It works. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. It saves everybody. This is what gets people saved. What we teach, what we preach, what we do is what gets people saved. It is what gets souls in heaven. It's what keeps people out of hell and gets them in heaven. And you know what? I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I don't care if we are the ugliest looking church that there has ever been. I mean, we do. We've got all the nasty looking people. I mean, I don't care if we, if we are the smelliest looking people or the smell not looking, you know, but we might be the smelliest church. We might be the poorest church. The church with the least amount of money. But you know what? As long as we're the ones getting people saved, I'm not ashamed of that. I'm okay with that. I'm not, tr- I'm, not, I'm not trying to beat these other churches on annual income. But I'm going to try to slaughter them when it comes to soul saved. I'm, and I, I hope we do that. And I believe we will do that. And we are. We're going to stay focused on souls. At Liberty Baptist Church, we, may, we need to make sure we never forget why we're here. We should never get so caught up and building buildings and becoming a big number and becoming the best looking church that we forget what we're supposed to be doing and that's winning souls. You, you, you cannot build a church without soul winning, especially when you're going to the groups we talked about. Or you can't build a church with soul winning when you go to these groups we're talking about. You can't do it. You won't build a church 
like a big, large amount of people, a large following, get large buildings just from going to these groups we talked about. But you know what? God will build that church. We won't. It doesn't make sense to do what we do. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't make sense mathematically. Man can build social clubs. And a lot of churches do that. Men can build social clubs. Some are very successful. But don't think God has anything to do with that. But God, you know, the gates of hell will prevail over those social clubs. But it's not going to prevail over God's church. And so let's be a group of people who have a clear goal. That's not about building buildings, but about winning souls. So with that, let's all stand together.